Hello and welcome to this uh, Women in STEM event hosted by the Women's Engineering Society. This event is part of a series of events that are being organised, some of which were in person earlier in the year um, and the uh, last event in the series we're obviously finishing off virtually now and it's been a collaboration with the uh, Institute of Physics, Palace of Science, Littonville, the Institution of Chemical en Engineers, the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Institution of Civil Engineers. If you wanted to find out more about the Women's Engineering Society, particularly what we are up to in the Northeast, you can email me on the, uh, our cluster email address shown on the slide there. Throughout the event, if you've got any questions for our panellists, um, you can pop that into the questions tab that you should be able to see on your screen. And if you're having any issues, um, do pop something in the chat and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Just pop the next slide, please, Helen. Yep. I'm going to very briefly talk about the Women's Engineering Society because I think Helen will I'll talk a little bit more about it in her talk. Um, but we were formed over 100 years ago. We are a charity and the largest network of female engineers in the UK. We are the creator of International Women in Engineering Day um, and continue to create a lot of content around that uh, celebration and, and help our members and our partner organisations celebrate that. As part of that, we award our WE50, the top 50 female engineers each year um, and have a number of other awards um, to celebrate for, for different things. The best newly chartered engineer, a uh, female engineer, for example. Uh, we support over 80 corporate education and not-for-profit partners with their diversity and inclusion. Um, we offer opportunities for our members to volunteer um, as part of one of our clusters. You can get in touch with me if you did fancy getting involved with our local cluster, uh, or I can direct you to another one if you are dialing in from another part of the country. Um, and you can also volunteer on one of our boards or our directors committees. We do also have membership options for men um, and it is very important for us to celebrate men as allies. I think we know that um, we're not going to make too much progress in engineering if we don't work with everybody to understand why we need to improve things in, in terms of the number of women in engineering um, and also need support to get to that point the next slide on thank you and um, there are another couple of events in this series coming up in the next few weeks so our next event is uh two weeks today same time um and you can find that either on eventbrite or on on go to webinar uh, and then the week after that the final event in the series um and those two events are, are going to be on two different topics, the Tyne Estuary Partnership, and that one is hosted by the Institution of Civil Engineers and uh, Batteries for Energy Storage, and that one is hosted by the Royal Society of Chemistry. In terms of the format of our evening tonight, um, we're going to start with a talk by Helen Close, um, who's going to let us all know a little bit more about some of the amazing female engineers from history. Um, after that, we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions for Helen throughout her talk, do pop those in the questions box. After that, we'll move on to a panel session where we're going to hear from four female engineers about why they think their area of engineering is going to have the biggest impact uh, and transform the future to the greatest extent. Back to our first speaker, though. So Helen has got a degree in history and a master's in women's history and heritage management. She's worked on numerous community heritage and museum projects over the last 20 years and currently works as the Centenary Trail Project Officer at the Women's Engineering Society. This brings together her passion for women's history and skills and experience in the heritage sector. Helen says she's from a family of engineers, but like so many others at the time, engineering wasn't a career for girls and she felt like she didn't have the right STEM skills to go into those sorts of careers. Helen thinks that it's these hidden messages that prevent girls from choosing careers in engineering and that is what we really need to try and overcome. The Centenary Trail project provides us with these role models that can inspire the next generation of young people into engineering. So with that, I'll hand over to Helen. 
Thank you, Joe. Um, as Joe says, I'm the Centenary Trail Project Officer at the Women's Engineering Society. I'm going to talk briefly about the Centenary Trail uh, Project, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of information on some of the women engineers that we've uncovered as part of the project. So the Centenary Trail Project was a National Heritage Lottery funded project. It now runs because of COVID. We're running until the um, end of February 2020. We have run Wikithons, which are um, editing workshops across the country for volunteers to improve and create Wikipedia pages for women, women engineers on, Wiki, um, on Wikimedia. Um, and then that data um, from Wikipedia actually populates what we've um, created, which is a digital trail um, map. Um, and I'll show that you show that to you shortly. Um, and that map actually shows the locations of past women engineers and past WES members of influence where they've lived and worked. So just briefly, um, that's the map. You can see it on the WES um, um, website. Um, the original goal for the map was to have um, 200 women located on that map. Um, last count, we had 341 women that have been identified and now have um, a place on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia. It was originally just the UK that we were looking at, but we've been so successful with the project that um, we have now expanded things um, further um, to the rest of the world. Um, it might sound easy to try and find out about these women, but believe me, um, it, it's not. Um, in order for things to be put on Wikipedia, um, we have to have evidence, research, resources and sources to back up what we've actually found to, for things to actually become valid on Wikipedia. But the women are there, they're there in history, but they're hidden. Uh, we have to go back to a grassroots level. Um, we had to look at census data, patent records, biographies and autobiographies, archive papers um, and journals, um, in particular the Women Engineer Journal. Now the Women Engineer Journal um, has been published since 1919 um, and it's been digitised by our colleagues at the um, Institute of Engineering and Technology. This was our primary source for starting to find women engineers um, over the last 101 years um, and it's given us a great amount of details um, about WES members and other past women engineers who've disappeared from history. Now obviously those of you, all of you, um, because you're on this event, know about the Women's Engineering Society but when I started this job I didn't have a clue, I'd never actually heard of the Women's Engineering Society um, and I claimed to be a women's historian and it was really important when I found out that there was this Women's Engineering Society to find out even more and obviously the project's actually given me the remit to be able to do that. So just briefly in a nutshell, um, WES was founded in the UK um, on June the 23rd 1919 after the First World War. Now as we know women responded to the call of arms um, after the first, uh, during the First World War um, and through engineering, they received education, training, pay and a degree of independence. And then when the war was over, women were expected to retreat to whence they came. The Women's Engineering Society was formed for the training and advancement of girls and women in engineering. And it's still our mission today. Here's a picture from the Women's Engineering Journal of some of the WES members. This, is, this photograph was actually taken in 1924. I love this photo, all these furs and hats and everything. Um, but all of these women were engineers and were interested in engineering. Um, and some of those women were notable suffrage campaigners as well. Over the last 101 years, women engineers have achieved remarkable things. Um, and going back even further, in time we find them as well but their history has largely been hidden it's been forgotten and swept under the carpet along with the dust they were expected to clean up as housewives as housewives or even worse their successes have been claimed by men so here come the girls I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of some of the west women who we've uncovered or we found out more about but there are many more stories that I don't have time for today. And there are lots of tales of innovation, invention, motorbikes, fast cars and aeroplanes. 
Women's Engineering Society was founded by seven eminent and mostly wealthy women and their names are there. You can find out more about them online on Wikipedia should you want to. But the first one I want to talk to you about is Lady Catherine Parsons. Now I term her the mother of Wes. She was instrumental in setting up the Women's Engineering Society. And Lady Parsons was also a co-founder of Atalanta Limited, a company set up specifically to supply employment for women in engineering work. She was married to Charles Parsons, who developed the turbine engine in 1884 and immediately utilised this new engine to drive an electrical generator, which he had also designed. Parsons' steam turbine made plentiful and cheap electricity possible, and it revolutionised marine transport and naval warfare. Lady Parsons said in 1919, at a lecture on women's work in engineering and shipbuilding during the war, it's been a strange perversion of women's sphere to make them work at producing the implements of war and destruction and to de then deny them the pr privilege of fashioning the munitions of peace. In her obituary, she was described as always at Sir Charles, Pars Sir Charles Parsons' side, always there to help him when he needed her, always supporting him with her really powerful mind and ready tact and perfect understanding. Lady Parsons was the possessor of a remarkable character. She was almost fiercely independent and she had in many ways a very masculine brain and a love of business organisation and leadership. Then the next one I would like to speak to you about is Dame Caroline Hazlitt. She was the first secretary of, of WES and um, editor of the Woman Engineer Journal for a considerably long time. She'd been a suffragette in 1913, and during the First World War, she trained for secretarial work. She then joined the Cochrane Boiler Company as a junior clerk, drawing up specifications. But by 1918, she was managing the London office, supplying boilers to the war office. Later, she moved to Cochrane's Scottish factory to learn practical boiler making. She designed and sold some using the name C. Hazlitt, so she didn't identify um, publicly that she was a woman selling um, these boilers. After World War I, Caroline stayed on the firm while many women were, had been obliged to leave the company. In February 1919, she was sent an advert by a friend. Required lady with some experience in engineering works as organising secretary for a women's engineering society. And she was hired by Lady Parsons as the West Secretary and paid, out, paid her wages by Lady Parsons' own purse. In 1925, Lady Parsons broke off relations with Wes after a disagreement with Caroline over the future direction of the society. Caroline believed that electricity was key to, forming a woman, key to transforming women's lives. Ways being made by electricity for a higher order of women women set free from drudgery who have time for reflection, for self-respect. We are coming to an age when the spiritual and higher state of life will have freer development. And this is only possible when women are liberated from soul destroying drudgery. I want every woman to have leisure to acquaint themselves more profoundly with the topics of the day. Hazlitt is responsible for the de design of the UK's three pin safety plug, having recognized the danger of the two pin plug in family homes. Laura Rani Wilson was another founding member of WES. She was from Halifax and she went from being a textile worker to a suffragette and from an engineering spouse to an independent builder. In 1907, she took part in a weaver's strike at Hebden Bridge, where she was arrested for inciting persons to commit a breach of the peace. When she appeared at the magistrate's court, she challenged the legitimacy of the court's exclusively male constitution demanding to be either tried by her peers or be provided with a woman lawyer. She was found guilty and sentenced to 14 days in prison. On her release, Wilson reportedly said, I went to jail a rebel, but I've come out a regular terror. Weeks later, she was one of 75 women arrested after a suffragette rally at Caxton Hall. She was sentenced again to 14 days in prison in Holloway, at Holloway. Laura became the first woman member of the Federation of House Builders, constructing 72 houses for workers in Halifax in 1925 to 1926. She was a founding member of the Electrical, Electrical Association for Women in 1924, along with Caroline Hasler. 
This interest was reflected in her housing estates, which she ensured had the latest gas and electricity appliances. In 1927, having moved to Surrey from Halifax with her husband, Wilson continued her trade as a builder by purchasing land at Englefield Green. Perhaps our, one of our most famous um, women engineers is Amy Johnson. Um, most people have heard of her. She was born in 1903 in Kingston-upon-Hull, East Riding in Yorkshire. She was introduced to flying as a hobby, gaining her aviator's license in 1929 and a pilot's A license. Um, in, in July 1929, both at the London Aeroplane Club. In the same year, she became the first British woman to obtain a ground sea engineer's licence. This enabled Amy to actually um, fix her own aeroplanes um, one, once she started her um, aviation tra um, history. Um, she married um, Sorry, um, she became the first woman to fly solo from England to Australia and she married Jim Mollison and together they made aviation history with and against each other. The Mollisons divorced in 1938 and Amy Johnson returned to her maiden name and to flying. She was the West President between 1935 and 1937 and she was killed in war service in 1941. And finally, I'd just like to touch on Verena Holmes. Verena um, developed and patented many inventions during her lifetime, um, including the Holmes and Wingfield pneumothorax apparatus for treating patients with tuber tuberculosis and uh, surgeons' head headlamps. Lots of patents that she held um, for um, over 12 patents she held for medical device devices as well as engine components. During World War II, she worked on naval weaponry and in 1940 became advisor to Ernest Bevin, the war minister um, on labour, on the training of munition workers. She founded the engineering firm of Leather and Homes in 1946, again, which employed only women. And she um, designed a safety guillotine um, for paper, making it suitable for use in schools. Um, and in 1958, she published a book, um, Training and Opportunities for Women Engineers. And I'm pleased to say that as part of the project, um, we have been successful in obtaining um, lots of Verena's diaries. We've had 18 of Verena's diaries and also um, and some letters and papers from her family. And so that's really exciting find for us and hopefully we'll be able to do more with that information um, as the project progresses. There are lots more ladies I can talk to you about um, and um, they can all be found online. Um, we've got Monica Maurice, and Mary Maxwell Chanel, who are exciting ones that we've also found out more about, and also Jeannie Dix. But 101 years later, today women still only make up just 12% of the professional engineering workforce, possibly the lowest rate in Europe. We hope that by the project we have raised the profile and um, provided some early role models of women engineers. Um, and um, I'd just like to say, who is your favourite woman engineer? Is she on the map? Can you get her there? And will you be there in the future? Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Helen. I'd now like to uh, introduce Alex, who's going to come on and, and run the Q&A with Helen. If you do have any questions, make sure you pop them in the box or you can put in the chat who your favourite female engineer from history is. Hi everyone, um, that was really good Helen, I really enjoyed it. We don't have any questions yet, but I noticed when you said at the end, if we can see our favourite engineers, um, which one is your favourite? Um, I think mine's got to be, um, I don't know whether you can see me there, hang on, let me turn my screen back on. Can you see me now? Can everybody see me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I think mine's got to be Verena Holmes, um, just because we've had the papers um, that we've had, so I've had been honoured to be able to have an insight into her life. Um, the diaries show a lot of the battles that she went through both as a woman engineer and as a woman um, during the um, between 1920s and the 1945 or 47 the last diary we have of her um, plus um, letters to a very good friend of hers um, and we see the sort of lack of self-confidence the battles that she has with engineering firms to try and get her designs recognized um, so I think I've got to say Verena 
Holmes is my favourite, but Monica Maurice, uh, who I didn't get time to talk about today, she was a very a, a dynamic woman as well. Um, and um, she's, you know, again, her history is very interesting. All of their histories are really, really interesting. Um, you know, and it's great that we have had this opportunity and word is getting out. There's lots of other projects now that are looking at women engineers. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the answer. My question. And we've had another question come in. It's if we were to find 101 male engineers, would the hunt for information have been so hard? No, not at all. It would have been very, very easy. I mean, part of the, the goal behind this project was um, the fact that there was such so so little evidence available um, for women engineers. Um, largely because the information that's out there has already been censored. Um, when it comes into books or into the public eye, it's already gone through a male, male filter, um, largely. Um, and the, the idea of the project was trying to trying to rec rectify that. Now, Wikipedia. I mean, the majority of editors on, Wik on Wikipedia um, are male, male um, typically white males, middle class males. Um, and again, we wanted to redress that balance. So obviously through the project, we've had a lot of women engineers and a lot of women volunteers that have learned how to edit on Wikipedia um, and been able to have their voice heard. So um, in answer to your question, it wouldn't have been so difficult to find 101 engineers um, if they were male, no, not at all. Um, we've just had somebody ask, um, what do you think leads to the low proportion of female professional engineers in the UK? Uh, this person found 12% shocking. And what do the other countries do better than us in the UK to get this number higher? Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of this is my own personal opinion as opposed to Wes, Wes's opinion. Um, but um, I think the barriers to women in engineer, engineering have been steeped in a lot of um, sexist history um, and um, in other countries um, that um, thought about women in engineering isn't there um, it's it's not it's not seen um, as um, a dirty men only profession um, and a lot of countries um, are much higher in their level of women in engineering so um, I think we still have a long way to go in overcoming the prejudice prejudices and the sexism that face women in engineering plus the barriers um, you know women um, aren't always it, it, it's harder for if women want families to combine um, combine family life with a professional career, um, and I think until we get that that um, equality that balance there, it it will be difficult. Um, you know, one thing I found interesting in looking at some of these women was how many of them actually had families and were able to juggle, and why they were able to juggle that. Um, and how many of them decided to stay single because their professions were, um, you know, um, what they wanted to follow and they want, didn't want family ties. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. um, and do we know whether this 12% values differed over time? So has it gone up? Is it a steady increase or? It's gone up very slowly over the, over the years. I think um, we are making progress, um, but, um, not as fast as bearing in mind we've been fighting this battle for 101 years um it's perhaps not gone up as quickly as we would like i think the goal is to try and get it up to 30 percent by i can't remember the actual i think it's 30 by 2030 30 percent by 20, but don't quote me on that but i think that's what the or what the the aim is um but um yeah Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions. Okay, right, let me try and turn the screen off. Thanks, Helen. I think you will be sticking around until the end. So if anything does come in during the panel session, then we can always um, check back in with you later on if there are any more questions. All right, so with that, I will ask the panellists if they can all turn their cameras and microphones on now, please. Thank you. So we're going to start with a quick 
poll to see what our audience think before we hear from any of our panelists. So hopefully if I launch that, everybody should be able to see the poll now. So which area of engineering do you think is going to transform the future to the greatest extent? So we've got building information modeling, energy, civil engineering, chemical engineering, or undecided. So I'll just give everybody a minute. Wow, I think we've definitely got a clear winner here. Um, so if I close that poll. So what we had there was 6% uh, for building information modelling, 6% for civil engineering, 6% undecided, 12% for chemical engineering, and 71% for energy. So uh, Laura Brown Energy, your task for this evening is going to be to try and maintain or better <laughs> the, uh, the lead that you've got. And for everybody else, see if you can steal some of the people who thought that energy was going to be the biggest, uh, the biggest one. So what we're going to do now is uh, each one of our panelists are going to introduce themselves and then talk very briefly about their area of engineering and why they think it is going to transform the future. Um, after that, Alex is going to manage your questions again. So what, when, when you hear things from our, from our speakers, do you think about what you might want to ask them, probe them a little bit more on the things that they say. Um, and then at the end, we'll do another poll and see if you've changed your mind. So with that, uh, our first panelist is going to be Laura Brown Bim. Hi, everyone. Um thanks a lot for that joe uh it's great always born first off <laughs> um so yeah i'm laura brown i am the group BIM manager at bomber and kirkland uh, a little bit about me i started my career as a civil engineer uh working on construction sites and then through the past um number of years the past 10 years or so transitioned into the digital technology side of the industry um the interesting thing about what i do now was that when i was at university it didn't actually exist then um as a career option um and it still doesn't necessarily exist in terms of a true engineering title hence why we've just called it building building information modeling or digital technology because we're not actually known as a digital engineer yet although i think it's coming um so the, the reason why I wanted to talk to you a bit about today is because we are very much entering the fourth industrial revolution. And from my side of things, technology is changing the way that we live. We're in a heavily data driven world. So what we do is we take all of that data, that analytics, um, and we use that to um, change the world. We deal with things like cybersecurity, robotics, analytics, automation, virtual reality, augmented reality, the internet of things, so all the analytics and everything that touches the internet, um, artificial intelligence, digital twins, um, I, can, I can go on and on about all of the different technologies that are used within the industry. Um, and I absolutely love it. It's really great. And the great thing about it is it helps improve accuracy, it provides efficiency, it reduces time scales. Um, it's a tool to collaborate and communicate better, which I think we could all do with. Um, it's one thing that in any industry you're in, I think everybody always says, I wish we could communicate better or I wish we could collaborate with other people. I think that's what technology does for us. Um, to quote um, Marshall Lew McLuhan, um, he observed that first we build the tools, then they build us. Um, and I think that couldn't be any more apt. So that they, it allows us to be lean and agile in the industry um, and the big data gives us real opportunities for innovation and i think we all need to innovate to improve the world we live in whether it be to help with climate change whether it's to build better infrastructure whether it's to build better energy um, renewable energy tools and um, from a chemical engineering perspective the the machinery and, and all of the tools that's required from that perspective so from my perspective Digital engineering underpins everything else, so that's why it's definitely the best. It, it allows us to um, deal with major challenges in society. It's allowing us to 
do with the growing and aging population, the urbanisation, the resource scarcity and public financial challenges that we have through communication skills, teamwork and adaptability that a digital engineer has, which sits alongside their technical knowledge. Why would a technical digital engineer not be the future of engineering? So just to sum up very quickly, I know it's probably a bit quick, but I thought I'll just go for it anyway. Um, in a data driven world, um, BIM and digital technology has to be the future. It will and does underpin all engineering disciplines. The future belongs to digital engineers, harnessing technical knowledge and combined with digital skills. And I'll come back to that quote again. First, we build the tools, then they build us. Thanks a lot, everyone. Laura, uh, you might have noticed that we do have two Laura Browns on the screen. So if <laughs> you do end up with a question specifically for Laura Brown BIM, then make sure you pop something like that in the question so that we do know who specifically you, you want to ask or Laura Brown Energy when we hear from, from her in a minute. But next up, it is Molly Bell who is going to talk about chemical engineering. Thank you very much, Jo. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Yeah, thumbs up, Paula, thank you. <laughs> Um, so my name is Molly Bell. I'm currently working as a technical plant engineer in the energy from waste um, side of Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. And as mentioned, I have a degree in chemical engineering and I got that in 2017 from Newcastle University. Um, since graduation, I've always worked for Suez. I joined them as a graduate engineer um, straight from uni. Started off in a projects team covering all of our energy facilities in the UK and only in December last year, I moved to an operational role uh, in one of our key energy from waste facilities in Teesside. Um, and I'm having a lovely time, <laughs> even though it doesn't sound very glamorous, uh, energy from waste. It's quite lovely. So why will chemical engineering have the biggest impact in transforming the future? Well, firstly, what is chemical engineering? We turn, and I did have to go to the chemical engineering website for this, the iChemy website, it's a bit embarrassing, but I couldn't think of a way to sum it up. So according to them, we turn raw materials into useful products that you use every day in a safe and cost effective way. And we do this by managing resources, protecting the environment and also keeping people safe. Now, that isn't all we do, I don't think. Chemical engineers are some of the most adaptable engineering professionals I've ever come across, working already in numerous industries, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, chemical obviously, oil and gas, waste management like myself, and wash treatment. We are adaptable in terms of knowledge. So me, for example, I've got a chemical engineering background, but the process I work in has required me to become almost an expert in mechanical engineering for managing our boiler and furnace. I've got some electrical engineering responsibility because we have a steam turbine and generator. And I also cover a lot of what an environmental engineer would cover in terms of residues and our emissions. No other engineer could do that. <laughs> so chemical engineering is not just a discipline. We think it's a way of thinking. We have to connect the dots and find links between things that aren't obvious. So this includes an attempt to try and rectify the underinvestment in sustainability in the environment that companies, have, that companies have had that are now trying to do their part for the, for, the, uh, for the environment and for the world. So for example, chemical engineers are working on the problems we see every day that are damaging the world around us. Things such as plastics, cleaning products and fertilizers all need to be manufactured in a safe way. And chemical engineers are working on a way to do that without damaging everything around us. In terms of the future, I've split this into two things. So we've got energy security and we've also got healthcare, which is very prominent at the minute. So in terms of energy security in the near term, hydrogen economy will become heavily reliant on chemical engineering design, rollout and operation. And in the next 50 to 100 years, energy from fusion could also become more critical. And some aspects of this will again rely heavily on chemical engineering design. The security aspect is interesting as the world changes between the modes of international cooperation Having a higher energy security could help nations thrive in terms of availability of natural resources. Now, in terms of healthcare, I attended a talk recently hosted by the ICME, which highlighted the work and impact of Teesside chemical engineering companies that, that they're having on the COVID front. 
Now, so, uh, these same companies and their chemical engineers are working to develop vaccines and scale these up, which is fantastic, obviously. COVID, a very relevant problem. This work on vaccine development, both in COVID terms and for non-COVID illnesses, as well as the uh, personal medical treatment, is likely to have a profound impact on society in the future. So in conclusion, why will chemical engineers have the biggest impact in transforming the future? I think we will use our adaptability and way of thinking to undo damage to the environment and prevent future damage, to support the global aim for energy security, and also to, to help to develop medicines to combat existing and new diseases. Thank you very much. Fabulous. <laughs> Next up, we've got Paula, who is right in the corner of civil engineering. I think you might be muted, Paula. No? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I have to reset it. Uh, so sorry, yeah, I'm Paula, uh, and even though I can't work the technology, I am a civil engineer. <laughs> uh, I've worked on a variety of projects, uh, including working on the Thames Barrier, which is obviously flood protection for London, working on nuclear new build project and oil and gas projects, which creates energy, working on process uh, projects, such as doing chemical plants and um, for aluminium smelting. And I now work in the road sector and help look after roads and bridges and drainage and things like that. So just from my sort of experience itself, you can see how broad uh, civil engineering is. So civil engineers are the oldest type of engineer. And our whole premise is based in understanding the world and harnessing its power for the good of the, all of society. All of our theories and practices and all of our teachings are based on really fundamental principles that go all the way back hundreds of years. And we didn't require energy and we didn't require technology and we didn't require chemical engineers when we started off. Now, the adaptability that Molly went on about and Laura's laughing because she knows there's no, nobody more adaptable than a civil engineer because we basically can do everything and we do do everything we uh all of the basics that we started off with were as the only engineers have basically been transformed into everything we do we also have um uh we're the ones that deal with disasters so we've got the disaster engineers as well so we're the ones that go out into the front line and solve problems on the hoof when there's nothing else there so we don't need all of these other people we can actually work on our own none of the others can say that so even military engineers which was the other side of the original engineers military and civil even they generally become civil engineers in civil life so how will we transform the future the most well i'm obviously going to say civil engineers are going to do it but let's just have a quick think about what the future actually holds there's no doubt about it our biggest challenge is going to be climate change we're already seeing extreme weather and all the protection schemes that civil engineers do, floods, dams, protection barriers, coastal protection, slope monitoring, it all sits in civil engineering field. Every building and structure has to withstand winds and it's all down to civil engineers. So, but even with greater protection schemes, unfortunately, we'll still have all of these disasters. And again, disaster management is civil engineers building emergency, sh emergency shelters and doing emergency river control, providing water and things like that. So without anything else, everybody needs somewhere to, to have shelter, water and sanitation. Have a guess who does that? Well, of course, civil engineers, we design it, we build it, we maintain it and we manage it. So what about transforming that future? So I'd like to think the transformation of the future is is something greater than um, just dealing with disasters. Uh, and we've definitely set our stall out. Our current president, Rachel Skinner, has said, we're gonna lead the way by providing that infrastructure for others. And so we're determined to be at the forefront of that transformation to allow us to combat climate change. So remember that civil engineers play a big part in your everyday life. You simply wouldn't have homes, water, energy, or communication without us. We totally operate uh, best working alongside all of these other great disciplines. But remember when you're voting, we're the only ones that can operate without everybody else. And we're the only ones that are gonna see us through regardless of what happens. So I think without a doubt, 
civil engineers are the ones that shall transform the future for the for the better <laughs> maintain everybody's future no matter what happens and we're there in the worst case scenario if a disaster happens for civil engineers so for now we are going to hear from our final panelist uh, and we'll save any discussion about what anybody has said so far until after we've heard from uh, Laura Brown Energy. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, um, voting for energy. Um, I'm no pressure whatsoever. Uh, so I would argue at the moment that energy's already started transforming the future. Um, and uh, First of all, I should maybe introduce myself. <laughs> so my name is Laura Brown Energy, <laughs> and I work at Newcastle Un uh, University, um, and I'm the Energy Research Program Manager uh, on the large energy systems uh, research progr uh, program uh, that the university runs. Um, my background is uh, physical sciences originally in industrial um, and manufacturing, um, and I moved into renewable energy um, maybe 2005, 2006, um, just, and I started working on uh, PV research, uh, looking at um, the photovoltaic materials that make up solar cells and how to make them more efficient. And um, that was before there was such a thing as solar in the UK. Um, and um, in 2011, um, the government brought in a policy to encourage people to put solar on the roof. It's a very generous incentive, and uh, a, a whole industry was born out of this. Um, and so I started working on PV system deployment and very quickly found out that you can't, it doesn't matter what technology you've developed, if you can't get it connected into the system and getting people using it, then um, there's no point in having it. So policy became very important. So I made a decision, conscious decision to move into a particular field of energy called whole energy systems or energy systems integration um, in particular. And this is trying to get all the different types of um, systems involved in energy working together. And uh, this is why I think being, me being called an energy engineer is a bit of a misnomer, because energy, I would say, is an end user of all the engineering skills um, across the sectors. We need electrical engineers, we need civil engineers, we need chemical engineers, <laughs> uh, we need BIM and design engineers. So we, I, I would say we're more an end user. Um, and um, so energy engineers tend to be very multidisciplinary um, and either specialists in one particular field or, like myself, a bit involved in everything. When it comes to transforming the future, as I say, I think um, um, the energy sector has, in the UK has done an excellent job of starting to transform itself, mainly due to some of the negative environmental impacts of the fuels that we were using at the time to produce our energy in the UK. There was big problems with um, acid rain in the 80s and 90s caused by the sulfur that was in the coal that we were burning um, and the um, uh, chemical engineers came up with a great solution for that which was to filter the... Uh, the <laughs> Molly's looking very proud of herself there. <laughs> um, so which was to filter the emissions from the, the the, um, the boilers and um, to collect that sulfur so that it didn't get into the atmosphere. So that was that was all retrofitted onto the, power, the coal power stations. Um, but one other emission particular that is really affecting the, the climate is the carbon dioxide that comes off when we burn fossil fuels. Now, unfortunately, if we were going to do the same process, because you can filter out the carbon dioxide, but the pilot plant that was tried in the UK at Ferrybridge they said if they scaled that up to the size, it would actually be twice the size of the current size of the whole plant, just to be a big enough chemical engineering plant to uh, filter it. So it was decided that that certainly form of carbon capture, carbon dioxide capture wasn't feasible. Um, so anyway, transforming the future. Since 1990, um, the UK has reduced its emissions um, from power um, by 70%. And that's because we've been trying to shift from coal and we've um, moved more to using gas, natural gas, for, uh, the, for producing electricity and using gas in our homes rather than burning uh, coal in fires. That's been the major shift. Also, a reduction of use, um, industrial use has uh, changed it. So changing our behaviours has been a big transformation um, in the sector. 
Um, so we've totally reduced our dependence on coal, but we've still got a very strong dependence on oil and gas, which are the other two main energy fuels. And those are used for gas mainly for heating um, in the industrial and um, uh, commercial set, sector, as, sector as well as in our homes. And we also use oil and diesel and petrol the, uh, for transportation and for aviation. And we really haven't yet tackled that. So to, to transform the future, we're going to have to find different ways to, to complete the, the final part of the puzzle on power. So as I say, we have reduced it, but we need to reduce it reduce our emissions from um, um, electrical power further um, by deployment perhaps of more electrical um, uh, renewable energy systems such as offshore wind, um, onshore wind and solar photovoltaics. Um, and more importantly, we need to tackle um, emissions from gas for heating and transport. And we can do that by adopting new techniques um, in fuels, for example, um, adopting hydrogen, either produced through an electrolyzer using that renewable electricity I mentioned, or by using traditional fuels such as uh, natural gas and then capturing the, the CO2 gas that comes off it and then storing that potentially um, um, under the sea. And then we have to shift um, our demand. We don't, do we really need this much energy? Um, again, that's a behavioral science, I would say, rather than an engineering topic. but um, Energy efficiency, I think, is the, the way to go. And the final um, part of the puzzle is transport. Um, and I would really say that the, the, the COVID has um, shown that if we reduce um, our dependence on travel for commuting, for example, and on air travel, we can really reduce emissions. Um, but if we can find renewable sources of fuel, then that, that could be the way. So um, in summary, I guess, we're halfway there um, in, in power. We've got a long way to go with transport and um, gas, but I don't think an energy engineer can do it on themselves. They're going to need the skills of all the sectors um, in engineering, but also help from um, behavioralists, policymakers, economists, because at the end of the day, nothing's going to change if we can't afford um, and pay for the transition. Um, so thanks very much, Joe. Thanks, Laura. I'm now going to hand you over to Alex, who is going to manage the Q&A. We've got about 25, 30 minutes for uh, ongoing discussion, and then we'll do the final poll and see where the audience's opinion is now. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, I've just got a comment come through saying I think what is very clear is that the future will need a multidisciplinary engineering approach and that all branches of engineering are equally vital and valid. What are the panellists' views on this? Um, certainly from my perspective, I think I, I probably speak from all of us to say that we're in complete agreement. And I think the great thing about an engineer is you, you are ultimately a multidisciplinary engineer, regardless of what engineer you are. Um, you have the skills needed to do the other types of engineering and to pick them up very quickly. I think the key thing about any engineer in the future is being able to communicate really well, have great teamwork and be adaptable um, because the future is changing. Um, and what we are taught in university isn't necessarily what we need 10 years post university. So I think that's what an engineer is really great for is giving you the skills and having that availability to be able to jump between different teams and do different types of engineering and, and change the world. Um, so yeah, totally agree. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, I'll add to that that obviously Molly said that she's worked and, and I had to learn different disciplines. I've run project teams with all disciplines, electrical, mechanical, piping, um, yeah you know, structural, um, and yeah, we, we do um, have a knowledge of, of each other's disciplines and need them. But linked to that, uh, Paula, sorry, Laura, um, is that it's good to have everybody who's got different backgrounds because from personal experience, it is really hard <laughs> trying to do 
everything because you know it, jack of all trade master of none so you know my knowledge on like i mentioned the mechanical engineering is never going to be as vast as somebody who has a mechanical engineering background so we do all need to work together and collaborate to meet the common goals which in this case that we've talked about a lot of you know environmental change healthcare stuff like that yeah i was just going to concur with what laura brown bim said that um the, the skills that we we need just now we we think about this at the university quite a lot that yes we're teaching people the traditional um maths and um engineering principles that you need but actually the technologies of the future aren't designed yet the answer how can we teach the students what they're going to need so we try to instill a a, a desire to have a lifelong learning and i would totally advocate that i don't know about anyone else but I have yeah. retrained, retrained often and learned. I'm constantly trying to upskill and keep on top of the the, the latest innovations. It's it, and it, it makes the job interesting, doesn't it? Because it's never the same. It's never the same one year to the next. So that that's 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 the joy of being an engineer, I guess. That leads on really nicely to a question that we have just had. That's uh, what courses or experiences do you think students or young professionals should focus on? Does anyone want to say anything? I, I would um, um I would say coding is very important um in most roles nowadays, trying to trying to model what you're trying to do or trying to find a digital uh, design perhaps of your system before you build it. That it's really Laura's nodding because it's really important that we don't waste money building stuff to see if something works. It's, we can now use technology to actually build in the virtual world what, what it is we want to make and it's a great way to um, fault, uh, do fault finding and analysis before we actually spend any money and it, it makes it much more efficient and much quicker to turn projects around and um, so I, I would either coding or the, the ability to understand a lot of the data programs would be useful yeah. And I'd add that anyone going into engineering, normally the entry criteria for most courses are maths and a science as well. And I think that's maths, all of us will have used an amount of maths um, in what we do. And uh, science not only teaches you some fundamental principles, but also a lot of logic and, and um, problem solving as well, I think. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. And it's key for the young, like, you know, college students and things, you know, when you're picking your university degree, it's daunting, isn't it? You know, I only went into chemical engineering because I met a chemical engineer and he kind of sold it to me. But I imagine if I'd met a civil engineer, he probably would have sold it to me as well. So it's super, her. well, sorry, oh my God, or her. <laughs> um, but when you uh, when you're picking the university or finding ahead, you know, try and get a little bit of experience in in something that you're interested in. If you don't want to go to start studying it, it's absolutely not for you, or it's not quite what you think. Because um, I experienced that, so I actually went into medicine first, and when I got to uni, I realised it wasn't at all what I imagined it to be. And then I had a, a gap year, got a little bit of experience um, with Suez actually, just for a couple of days working on one of their sites, and then from that went into chemical engineering and obviously stuck it out. Um, so yeah, just try and get, you know, attending events like this is absolutely excellent just to get to know what engineering is, what different types of engineering are available, stuff like that. So we've got a question here that uh, the person who's asked has said they've had a lot of comments in jobs that women are accepted into design roles in engineering, uh, but don't necessarily work on construction sites. Um, some countries have rejected this and explicitly make an effort to train women. Um, has anyone suffered discrimination like this? And what sort of comments do you have on the psychology or ideology? I'm probably going to jump straight in first. Um, my early career was based on site. Um, I must say I was the only female engineer in the northeast um, in my company. Um, and I wouldn't say I, I met a great deal of discrimination. If anything, they were like brothers. And I had a lot of male mentors who absolutely drove me um, to success and to deliver. Um, and I never felt any different. I was never necessarily any different. Um, yes, men are chivalrous. And it's something that you have to overcome. It's something where um, the guys would often offer to carry all of my equipment because it was heavy. And it's a it's a fine balance that has to be struck whereby 
as an engineer on site, yes, I didn't want to demean them by saying, no, I don't want you to carry me equipment. But at the same time, that is part of my job. So I wanted to carry my own heavy equipment because that was me. Um, so there was a fine line and a balance to be struck. But I haven't, yes, there's been the odd bit and I can't say that there, there isn't and there won't be in the future. Um, but the large and part of it was that actually I was accepted and it was brilliant. And I loved being on site. It's something I miss being in the office now, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm sure Paul has probably had a similar journey. Yeah, so I've all, also sort of um, cut my teeth quite a bit on the construction site. You'd be if you're surprised at the 12% women in engineering, you'll be astounded that it's about 1% of women in construction. And uh, I actually think the 1% is rounded up quite significantly. Uh, women in construction are few and far between, there's no doubt about it, and still are. Uh, but you'll find that those of us that have been in there and, and are still there normally love it. Um, because it's something that, that we really uh, do enjoy. And there is a certain camaraderie on site that you don't get in the office. Um, it's normally a little bit on the uh, bluer and naughtier side than the um, more refined office crack. But uh, but for those of us that enjoy it, um, it's quite an experience. Yeah, yeah I would say um, in my career, I, I, I agree with Laura. I haven't had discrimination as such, but I do. Ha ha have been on shift with 40 engineers and I'm the only woman on shift um, and that's you're doing the role exactly the same as everyone else it's just you're you're, <laughs> you're just you're just the only female there and um, it, it isn't changing quickly enough I don't think and you know, a lot of that is just um, we're trying you know the, we're trying at schools and apparently as we as you come up through school and um, it's 50 50 and all the GCSE subjects you would associate with engineering at A level, it's not. So somewhere between 16 and 17, I think that is in England for um, choosing between A levels and after you get your GCSE results, we're losing, we're losing girls choosing the options that could lead to a career in engineering. So it is still something fundamentally happening if we want to, to address that. Um, my experience has only been positive. Um, it's, it's just, it's just, no, don't, try not to take it personally. People, you'll, you'll come across people that you don't work well with, but that's never usually to do with the gender. It's just usually to do with personalities. So you're never going to like everybody that you work with in your career. But um, don't take it personally. And um, and if someone is a, a bit like, well, you're a girl, just say, and so what? <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that means I'm awesome. So, it, so that's fine. <laughs> you know, it's almost about having a little bit of self-confidence and a bit of self-belief, which is hard. And I know women are, and again, I'm generalising, more, more likely to beat themselves up a little maybe about self-confidence, but um, it's just having that, and, and just that faith that you can that it, that it will all come out in the wash. It'll be good. Just to stick my uh, new pair of on that, because I'm obviously at the very early stages of my career, already graduating three years ago, and I've often found that a lot of the men I work with have uh, daughters my age. <laughs> so often at work, similar to what Laura was saying, they do try and shield me a bit from certain activities and certain conversations because, you know, they don't let me fight my own battles. For example, if I've had a bit of a conflict with someone or if a contractor's not getting back in contact with me, they kind of take over that for me, um, which is lovely <laughs> of them. Um, but at the same time, you know, I do want to learn how to, you know, stand up for myself and, and you know, get that contact back from, from external companies and things. So I've just kind of said that to, to my colleagues and, and now we, we work together to give me those skills um, in terms of, you know, conflict management and things like that. But it's, it's still nice to, to be seen in a way that, you know, they're quite protective over me because it's probably saved me from falling out with a few people when I'm just like, oh, you can go and speak to Mark instead of me. I've had the odd uh, person when I was admin as well, which was quite disheartening um, at the start of my career, especially considering the, the main incident came from somebody quite high up in HR who was an advocate for women in the workplace and, and, and she assumed I was a, an admin assistant. Um, there's obviously nothing wrong with but it's the assumption that it, I have a problem with uh, but now I'm very vocal <laughs> in saying no I'm the, the key engineer on this site uh, if you need any information you come to me so 
thanks for that. Um, we've had another really good question, and it's: Have you experienced imposter syndrome within your work experience? And if so, um, can you comment on how to work through it? So that's another one for everyone. I don't know who wants to go first. I'll jump in on that straight away. Um, with me being, I'm not going back to being early, early in my career. I'm not just being like I'm so young. Um, I got given a role of a technical plant engineer um, only a couple of months after finishing my graduate scheme and the facility I was put on was a key energy facility for Suez and what I mean by that was we solely owned that facility um, and that was really daunting you know I wasn't asked to do an interview there was a business need for an engineer at that place and I just got picked up and put there um, and, and you know obviously the director and people knew I was capable otherwise they wouldn't have done that um, but for the first you know, five or six months of me working there, I doubted everything I ever knew about energy from waste, chemical engineering, personal management, professional management, all that stuff, how to manage a project, stuff that was the basics that I'd learned during my graduate scheme. I just totally doubted because I was the youngest on site and I was the person with the least, the least experience on paper. But as I've started to learn and work with people, I found that the experience I've got from elsewhere in the business is absolutely critical to the what's going on, on on site, and they don't have that because they've always been on site. So I'm slowly learning that I do know my stuff, and I, and I do need to speak up for myself. But that was a massive thing for me at the, at the beginning, and I, I get little bits of it now. Um, but it's just about building your self confidence, and you know, if people have confidence in you, and you, love you, you need to realise that oh, they have that confidence for a reason. Um, I think one thing is to know to just make sure that you, uh, to work through it. I definitely definitely felt it quite a lot. Um, one way to have deal with it is to <laughs> um, is to um, think about well, what, what would I what would I say to myself if I was giving myself advice if I wasn't myself? If you know what I mean. So if I, if my colleague had the same problem, what would I say to them? And a lot of it is well. You can't know everything, so as long as you put your hand up when you, you're stuck or when you've got a problem, and or have a go and go, you know what, I'm getting a wee bit, this is maybe a bit dangerous, or there's, there's a risk I'm going to do something here. So it's about using good judgment about the risks that you could take without knowing 100% what you're doing, and then stop and go, right, I'm about 90% here, I think I'm going to do this, is this the right thing? So just getting validation from someone that you trust that what you're planning to do is the good thing that really helped me so it's almost like here's what I plan to do is that okay you know and then someone goes yeah, yeah that's exactly right um, and so having a really good either mentor or um, just people that you value the opinion of doesn't need to be someone as a mentor could be a friend could be a colleague and um, senior colleagues are, are really good at this and um, the more you can learn from the senior colleagues the better the more you can do stuff for them, it means they don't need to do as much. And I find senior colleagues really like <laughs> offloading things. So that's a great way to learn. So you're you're learning, you want to learn that information. You're doing them a favor by taking on some of the burden of their role. And um, so that's that's a one way to do it. So you feel you've got that confidence of someone supervising you, if you like, and then you're doing this thing that's stretching you. That, that, that's that's the best way to do it, in my opinion. I think it's something that I think most people have experienced and to some degree I'm sure um, male engineers have exactly the same degree of imposter syndrome in, in some cases. Um, it's something I've definitely experienced and I still experience it now. I don't think it'll ever go away. I think it's just something that you have to kind of accept it in, and, and understand that that's what you're feeling at that moment in time. Um, it, I still stick by the whole fake it till you make it. It was something where I was told that if you're unsure, then then fake your confidence and it'll come naturally eventually. Um, and I think that that stood me in good stead so far. So I'm going to stick with that. Um, and again, I, I, I really reinforce what um, what Laura was saying, where you really have need to have some good mentors or a good kind of team or, or group of people around you who can lift you up and, and make you see how good you are at certain things and, and give you that confidence boost that sometimes you just need when you're in a little bit. Um, so yeah, fake it till you make it, guys. And lastly, yeah, I'll echo everybody's oh, yeah, thing. Sorry. Uh, comments. That's all right. And uh, yeah, I think everyone's felt an amount of self-doubt. Um, doesn't matter what your gender is, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you don't ever push yourself to do something new, 
you're never going to feel it. And then that would be a pretty, pretty sad state of affairs if you just, oh, that's sorry right, if that's what you want to do. But, you know, you would never progress and never learn anything. You would never do anything exciting. So a little bit of it isn't a bad thing. Thanks, everyone. Um, our next question is, um, would you be able to please comment on the work life balance as a woman in engineering? Can you have it all and still be successful? <laughs> I'll go with that one. I think anybody that wants it all is giving themselves a really, really hard job, quite frankly. Uh, I have chosen not to have children. And that's mean, meant my work life balance is much easier than some people's. But, you know, um, everyone has to make their own decisions for themselves and um and then you know you've only got 24 hours in each and every day and you still need to sleep um and there is no doubt about it one thing that you'll learn as you get older work is not life and a work life balance should be balanced and you'll actually be happier and more productive if you do achieve that balance um over to others Um, I would agree with that as well. Um, um, I chose to have one child and I've got a step stepson as well um, who's in university and um, the, there was a bit of stepping back um, when uh, particularly um, I was working in a, a laboratory at the time when I was pregnant and you just couldn't really from a risk point of view go into the laboratory even though I was going well I can still want to do my job it's just got well there's someone else you've got to worry about now and I think that 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 was certainly my experience of well you know I've got other things to worry about as well as my job um, and I've stopped calling it a career and started calling it a job that's another thing <laughs> um, but um, what, what I did find was that it, I was able to use that time when I was maybe what some people might call it taking your foot off the pedal a little to maybe um, pick up some other other skills so maybe doing um, in the evenings, maybe doing a little bit more learning, um, getting a few more um, uh, credits on your on your uh, CPD or something like that, um, um, get your get accreditation. So things that you can do in the background to keep your career ticking over. Um, doing, I think, I hate to say, COVID has got a good side. If, if the only good side is that we're doing a lot more of these sort of. In, um, you don't need to travel for four hours to go to a meeting then it, it, it's got to be a great thing and this technology we're using tonight for example isn't new so why is it now new that we're doing these sort of virtual events so um that that really helps with the, the balance so um some people um I've, I've met some amazing engineers who seem to have it all and then when you have a little chat with them uh, so how's it going well the nanny didn't turn up today <laughs> so or my mum can't take the kids, it's a nightmare. So um, yeah, and so it, there's very few people who are doing it all without additional support, um, or they have a, a, an amazing partner who can um, can take the step back for them. Um, yeah, I'd, you possibly could get it all, but you would need a lot of support, I would imagine. Thanks everyone. Um, so our next question is, do any of the panellists have any experience in working in countries such as Saudi, India or Pakistan, for example, and what guidance would they give or in hindsight want to receive regarding working as a female engineer in such locations? Um, at, at the university, um, we have a lot of uh, researchers, engineering researchers from uh, these countries. Um, female and male. Um, they, 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 I don't see they don't they don't seem to treat each other any differently than we treat each other. So um, I, I can't comment on cultural um, laws and I, I have no experience of that, I'm afraid. No. And I've done work with people from some of them countries, and actually uh, some of them the officers have more female staff than the staff ratio than the they do in the UK. Um, but it's the same with everything. If you want a, a good working environment comes from good communication, um, listening to people, uh, being honest, um, you know, and, and all the good things that that would make any good working relationship, I would assume, would, would work in any culture, in any environment.
Um, our next question is, can you all please share your personal vision for the engineering industry? How do you see the 12% figure changing and how long will it take to achieve gender equality in engineering? Um, I think the statistics are at the current rate, it'll take another two or 300 years to get 50-50 at the rate that we're going. I think we're going up and down about 1.5 or 1% a year. So it's going to take a wee while <laughs> and we're going down as well as up. Um, I think um, there's, I don't know about you, but there's certain, there's certain roles that lend themselves to different characteristics of people. I don't think it's a, a gender necessarily thing. It's a behaviour and a type of person that, that you are. I don't know if this rings with anyone. Um, they always say, do you like playing the Lego as a kid? <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> uh, we should see, uh, yeah. It's, um, it's in media awareness and spatial awareness and all that kind of thing. So it, it might not be as detailed as, or as it's more about choices and opportunities and no barriers, I think, more than getting to 50-50 or getting to 60-40 or, you know, exceeding. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's like that. I, I, I'm not sure about anyone else thinks that if 50-50 if, if is a target or... A crystal ball's coming up empty, ladies. <laughs> I think when um, people talk about diversity in the workplace, their aim is always to represent the general public. So I think you'd want a proportion that kind of mimics what the what the, what the world's public was. Um, but I think linking back to a question that was asked earlier on about uh, you know why don't girls go into engineering? Um, a recent talk I went to it was found to be very much about the, the women that they see in their lives. Um, so if you think about the women that you see when you were younger, so I'll use myself as an example, uh, my mum and sister are both nurses and, you know, my nan is obviously retired, um, but before that she worked in British home stores. Um, and then the other women that I saw regularly were things like my hairdresser and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if girls don't see uh, women doing careers in STEM, then it doesn't really become an option for them because they don't think of it in that way. Um, so I think it's like a bit of a cycle, like to get more women, we need more women. But to get, like to get more women, we need, you know, so it's just like gonna go um, round and round. And the work that we're doing, you know, to encourage it is fantastic. But then you get students saying to us, we're sick of hearing about engineering. We don't want to, you know, stop telling us to go in, into engineering. So it's, it's a fine balance really of, of encouragement, uh, but not sickening them off before they get to college. Yeah, I mean, one of the, a fact I found out um, yesterday or today was that actually a lot of um, children have it set in the mind between age seven, uh, five and seven, that what uh, jobs are done by what people look like, whether it be gender, colour, um, you know, what the jobs entail, what they wear, um, whether the dirty jobs or clean jobs. So I think those of us that are in the industry have a a bit of a sort of duty to actually um, look to them earlier age groups and actually just be seen. Um, I think it's also, it, for me, it's about standing your ground as well. Um, I've just getting back in touch with somebody that I used to know as a child and they asked me what I did and I said I was an engineer and they said I can remember you saying you always wanted to be an engineer when you were younger. Um, and I can remember being at school and being told that no an engineer is a man's job. And I, I think it's great now that that's now not the case. Um, I'm only in my early 30s, so it wasn't that long ago that that actually happened. Um, and it's great now that that has changed. But stand your ground if, if you want to be an engineer or you want to be something that links in with engineers, even just working with engineers is an amazing career. Um, then stand your ground. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, I think is really important. And I, again, I resonate with what everybody else has said on the panel about making sure that women are visible and making sure that you have the right role models. Um, and that is important. Um, all of my engineering role models were all male, but it didn't stop me from thinking I still wanted to do that myself. So, um, yeah, really good. I was, I was just thinking about something Molly said about not 100% sure knowing what you wanted to do when you were at school. Maybe we stream people too early it's like you must choose you must know what you're going to do you must choose what you're going to do when you go into university maybe that's one of the challenges maybe a wee bit more understanding how 
what goes on in the world gives you a wee bit more. Well, actually, I want I could use do that to make a difference, you know, because most people want to make a difference in their career choices, yeah. don't they? And it's um it's understand, you know, maybe 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 we need a bit more of um, people coming into engineering later in life rather than you have to be an engineer from university. You know, maybe maybe there is especially now with for. Um, embracing technology, um, Laura. You'll see there's, you know, it's it's yeah. IT skills, it's you know, it's data, it's it's uh, you know, a whole lot of different skill sets that you know we keep we can be using. We can be bringing more people into the sector that way rather than having to make that choice very early on. Maybe yeah, the, the cross sector collaboration is really important in it. I think we were just having a discussion earlier on this week that actually the arts plays such a huge role within engineering now as well. Um, in, in the actually whether it be STEM or STEAM now, so science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. Um, and I think because you just need to look around you, you need to look at nature, you need to look at the arts and they all play a massive role in what the future of engineering might look like. Um, looking at different types of bugs and how we can create facades that um, deal with um, Solar collecting solar power energy and dealing with the wind and collecting that, it can all be found from different geography and, and nature and, and biology, you name it. So that cross collaboration, Laura, I think is like you say, is really important. And maybe we do um, set our goals out too early. I'm going to stick by mine and say I, that I'm happy I stuck with mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I stuck with mine too. Well, when I was at um, school. I was always really good at science and maths and I was like quite clever <laughs> and I think because people noticed that they were like you should go to medical school you should go into medicine because you are clever yeah. and that's what other people do they go to be doctors and I was kind of followed this route you know did all of the prep that the legwork to get into medical school was was a lot and when I got there I was like oh gosh maybe the aim was to get into medical school and now I'm here I'm like oh this isn't quite what I thought whereas you know we should be pushing people into you know it's not just medicine it's not just industry engineering is a, a fantastic profession to go in and perfect if you're into your stem and also it's not the end of the world if you're not you know i know a lady who uh, um college did photography you know very arty a levels and i think maybe one science and she she got into university to do chemical engineering and now she's a health and safety professional so she didn't start off in stem and then she found a little bit of an interest but as you say it's linked to the arts in that way so yeah, I totally agree. Not forcing people into, you know, closing their option triangle too early. Because if you change your mind, if you don't like it, sometimes it's a bit of a detriment, and people don't want to go back and retrain because they think it's too late. Um, so yeah, taking that pressure off would be, would be key, I think. The, the government announced today the Green Skills um, Task Force. There you go. There's a, a government word for you, <laughs> and um, that's to try and see how are we going to meet the Meet the needs of climate change that Paula was talking about. So, um, and the transition from the the way we're living today, which is totally unsustainable, to the way we need to live so that we don't ruin the planet. And we need to do that really quickly. So we can't wait till the kids that are at school just now graduate, choose which discipline they want to do, then learn enough in the sector to then make a difference. We need to use the people we've got, professional people we've got just now to make the transition. So it's going to be actually really really challenging to get the people who have got the brains to do it but maybe just aren't in the right ro right, right role so they've got the, the, the smarts to be to, to help us with this challenge but maybe it aren't their, their, their expertise isn't applied in the sector that we need them to be for the climate emergency response so um i think that'll be that'll, that'll come out in this green, um, green skills task force i think there'll be a lot of them um, um career transitions as well as um uh, uh, and it'll be growth the uh, real growth in, in new sectors that again as, as we we're saying earlier these sectors didn't exist five ten years ago but they exist now and we, we need to get people working in them just to finish up then i wonder if each of the panelists you all spoke very passionately about your areas of engineering is there anything specific to your area of engineering that could be used to help attract or retain women um into those industries 
I think I think the biggest hook that um, energy has is is it's going to help the client. You know, I, I, in my experience, again, I hate to spit it to, but women seem to be um, wanting to make a difference. You know, want to help make a difference. That, that seems when I ask women about why they've taken career choices, that's well, I want to make a difference in this, and I want to make a difference. And as I say, this challenge is so immediate and so huge, and the prize is so great. You know, saving the planet. You know, that's a great way to to to, to help. So that would be my my suggestion. And for the civils, uh, we currently have a female um, president, uh, only our second one in over 150 years, um, well, in over 200 years. Um, we have our uh, regional chair, Laura Brown, <laughs> <laughs> who's a female. And I do think that having people in them uh, positions and them chair positions encourages more people to that are already in the industry to um become active and better themselves and to to improve themselves in the professional development and get more things to put on the cv and also it means that there's more stem ambassadors to go into schools to have their own models so i think it's it's uh, we're in a good place with the civils in terms of um chemical engineering this is probably the same for all other engineering disciplines but the um, range of jobs you can have uh, with, with, a, with a degree in engineering is so vast. Like the reason I went into engineering initially was because I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I could, could have gone into law, finance, uh, obviously the engineering side of things. And it just so happened I went into engineering because of the work experience I'd done as an intern. Um, but even then, if you did go into engineering, if, if you wanted to pursue something um, very, you know, specific to your preference. So if you had a, a very passion for food or makeup or, or the environment, as, as we've said, you can often pursue that in engineering. And I think promoting that to young people and letting them know that engineering is one of these things that doesn't limit you. Once you, once you kind of hit that path, people might be more enticed um, to follow the profession. Yeah, that's great. Um, from a from a being more a, a digital technology perspective. Um, also, just to let you know that Paula is our vice chair as well at the ICE in, in the northeast. So <laughs> we've got a chair and a vice chair who are female, which is great. Um, but from a from a technology perspective, I think it it really is the diversity. Um, there really is no day the same, um, and, and I'm sure that's for all engineering disciplines, but certainly for technology and, and being able to work on so many different types of schemes. Um, digital technology in, in BIM is worldwide as well. It's not just UK based. Um, you can be in the UK and working on a, on a project in Hong Kong or in the USA somewhere. Um, and that's what's really amazing about digital technology and just the huge opportunity for innovation. If ever you've wanted to kind of, if you've got a great imagination or, or you just want to, you do want to change the world, the the absolute depth for innovation and opportunity for innovation within the digital technology and BIM arena is just so vast it's unreal. So that would be my pitch. Right. And on that, I'm going to launch the poll to see if our audience have changed their mind. If you'd like to vote on what you think, which area of engineering is going to change the future to the greatest extent. That's nearly everybody in the audience voted. I'm now going to close the poll and share those results with you. What's the prize again, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, well done, everybody. <laughs> I think everybody's took some votes from Laura there. Um, <laughs> what's most interesting, actually, is that how much the undecided has gone up. So that was percent before. And so what what we've done tonight is uh, is confused everybody. <laughs> I think it's because there was a, all of us. That's what they they, they decided. Yes. Yeah. And 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 I think everybody on the panel as well talked so much about how engineers do all work together. And I think that that is really very true. Um, and so maybe the undecided is is people wanted to just say that it's all of it. Everything is, is going to transform the future. So with that, um, thank you so much to our audience for joining us tonight. 
Thank you to our fabulous panellists for a, a great discussion. Thank you to Alex for managing the Q&A and thank you, Helen, for a great talk on history. It certainly let me know about some amazing role models from history that I had no idea about before either. So, uh, so thank you very much. And okay. don't forget that we do have those other two events coming up in the, the series, one of them two weeks today and the other one on the 3rd of December. So do join us for those if, uh, if you're interested. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.